Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarp, they broadcasting from Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of Friday, the 9th of October, 2015. And there is a policy fight in Washington, D.C. It's between the war psychotics who are spreading war psychosis on the one hand and some sane forces that have emerged in the Obama administration. These are the realistic or at least more realistic thinkers. But just to get to set the stage, a death threat against Obama again. Small drone crashes near White House despite ban against flights in D.C. And I'm reading from USA Today, 11 o'clock in the morning on October 9th today. U.S. Park Police confiscated a drone that crashed on the ellipse. That's right behind the White House. You can see it from the back of the White House. Near the White House on Friday and issued citations. And the rest of it is baloney is the main thing is if you were sitting there, you would read that as a threat. And we've had this repeatedly with Obama. My personal guess is that this has something to do with the general posture of Obama, of course, to be sure. But one of the things that seems to have riled up the warmongers, the strange loves, and boy, do we have them. The strange loves are not happy with Obama's press conference of last Friday afternoon. Now, I couldn't cover it because it was happening at pretty much exactly the the same time that we were taping this program. But in the course of that, Obama talked about mumbo jumbo, that people who are telling him to go into the Syrian conflict or quagmire as he sees it, and it certainly would be. uh, And he says, I ask these people, what happens after that? Suppose I have a no-fly zone. Suppose I have a safe haven. And they respond with mumbo jumbo and half-baked ideas. So the war psychotics, and we know them, the neocons, the humanitarian bombers, the one-trick ponies, the chicken hawks, they're going with the usual tissue of mumbo jumbo and half-baked ideas. And they know who they are. For example... We pick up the Washington Post of this morning, Friday, October 9th. Here we have a distinguished op-ed in the middle of the page, (coughs) countering Putin. There's no mystery behind Russia's motives in Ukraine and Syria. Condoleezza Rice dripping with blood, dripping with human blood. And Robert M. Gates, that that, uh, cold... Uh, guy that that uh, you know basically sending people to their deaths right spreading violence all over the world from behind that farm boy persona that's the thing that that he's always used and here we see um, for example uh, the uh, the question of the half baked ideas we have to create our own facts on the ground say rice and gates We have to create our own facts on the ground. No-fly zones and safe harbors for populations, read terrorists, read ISIS, are not, quote, half-baked ideas. (laughs) So they're quoting Obama. They don't exactly mention him, okay? They mention him in the article, but that's, that's a very interesting quote. That one has rankled because that's the kind of you know, stupid excuse for thinking that these neocons and and, uh, humanitarian bombers have been using. So now let's take a look. Um, Let's let's talk about some of the more insane ones, and then we can say something about what we now, I think, know to be a uh, a faction fight uh, in the White House, in the administration. Interestingly enough, the National Security Council and a guy called Robert Malley, coming from the uh, International Crisis Group originally, some kind of a leftist. This guy's coming out of the Soros humanitarian bomber camp, but seems to have evolved. These institutions, designed by Machiavelli, interpreted by John Adams, and somehow then refined over time, they have this ability to grab hold of people and make them change. And you come in there with a bunch of insanity, and eventually... It mellows out, and then something else can emerge. That would be, the, I think, my guess with Robert Malley. You can read about him in my 
uh, book, uh, Obama, the unauthorized biography. But let's let's listen, first of all, to the chorus of uh, war psychotics. Uh, the first one, of course, is big new Brzezinski uh, in response to the fact that Russia has sent these 26 cruise missiles on the previous day from the Caspian Sea, three corvettes and one frigate, but they pack a punch with these uh, caliber cruise missiles slamming into various sites. And where every time they mention this, they got a whine. Yeah, but some of them crashed in Iran. <laughs> well, so what? Uh, and even that is denied, right? So what's your fail rate anyway? What's the fail rate on a Patriot missile? So um, this uh, this uh, the situation uh, proceeds with Zbigniew Brzezinski saying, well, the fact that Russia has attacked some terrorist rebels that have been trained by the CIA, Al-Qaeda members, Nusra, he says, that's got to be Casus Belli. The United States has to go to war to defend Al-Qaeda. Well, maybe he he feels this, I, you know, he's the father of Al-Qaeda after all, right? He created it along with Gates. It's big new and Gates were the two guys who set up Al-Qaeda with Osama bin Laden back in 1980, 81, during the Afghan war. So Zbigniew says, those Russian forces out there in Syria, they're at the end of a long supply chain. They're dangerously isolated. We could easily disarm them. And he puts that in quotes to sig signify that what he's really saying is destroy them. Well, <laughs> Ivo Dalder, uh, another former uh, diplomat dealing with, uh, with Moscow, says, yeah, you could destroy them. But then you'd have to you'd have to game in the Russian response. Man, oh, man. Imagine the Russian response to the destruction of 50 planes and uh, several thousand forces. This would, this would essentially blow the lid off the world. Hold on to your hats. Are you really going to incinerate your family in a thermonuclear fireball for the sake of some lousy, literally lousy, terrorist rebels in Syria from al-Qaeda that you've been told did the... 9-11, I don't share his view in general, but that's what you've been told. That's what most of these people believe. And then, of course, ultimately, the goal is to save ISIS. So Zbigniew Brzezinski should be spending more time with his family. Why doesn't he take his daughter on a vacation and get her out of there? Um, we've also got Hillary Clinton burnishing her warmonger credentials, if that were necessary, by calling for a no-fly zone. And a safe haven for terrorists. Mumbo jumbo, half baked ideas. We've also got David Ignatius. My heavens, David Ignatius, usually the calmer wing of the State Department. We're we're also picking up a vibe that uh, the State Department is now seething with the desire for a safe haven and a um, and a no fly zone. He writes today, same uh, same edition of the Washington Post, corralling our objections in Syria, David Ignatius, Washington Post, today, Friday, the 9th of October. What about safe zones in northern and southern Syria? He goes on one better. Not just a safe zone in the north to keep open that famous 65-mile car, but we've got to have a safe zone in the south so you can get aid in from Jordan and other places. That still seems like a good idea, so long as they're established as corridors of humanitarian assistance and revived public services rather than an armed U.S. or Turkish military intervention to help the rebels. Well, lots of luck with that. At the same time, though, he says the United States has lost the chance to make Assad's department departure a precondition. Now, the uh, worst of all of these, in terms of the most dangerous right now, is Carter, I'm sorry, Ashton Carter. I get, he looks so much like Carter. Uh, Ashton Carter must go. Fire Ashton Carter. He's a sign of fire. Dear Ashton, get out of there. You're a warmonger. Out. Next minute. Crisis Radio, Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So the military psychotics, the militarists, the neocon fascist madmen, the humanitarian bomber hypocrites are all mobilized 
And um, this is a sad story. We've discussed Zbigniew Brzezinski, who says, if you touch a hair on the head of an al-Qaeda terrorist in Syria who claims to be pro-democracy and anti-Assad, the U.S. goes to World War III to defend those, those terrorists. My thesis um, in politics for quite a while has been the crisis of the U.S. ruling class. The U.S. ruling elite is clinically insane. They have lost their moorings in reality. They are incompatible with the survival of this country. The, when you're going to reform anything, even before you start with campaign finance reform, as some people uh, seem to think is uh, the top priority, you've got to change that ruling class. There's got to be a way to kick some of these people out so that they can spend more time with their children to you create a special um, resort uh, in the Bahamas or something that they like and let them go there, give them scholarships, right? give them stipends, whatever it takes, get them out of government. These people are insane. So David Ignatius, again, usually uh, reasonably, um, well, in touch with the State Department, um, there He's also, I forgot to mention, right, with David Ignatius, not only does he want the safe zones and the no-fly zones in northern and southern Syria, but he also wants to make a deal with al-Qaeda. And here he says, um, the Pentagon needs to assess why the overt public U.S.-backed program to train moderate terrorist rebels has failed, right, only four to five, according to General Austin, have come forward. But there's also the CIA program, and this time Ignatius, usually speaking for the State Department, but now for the CIA, says a better bet may be the CIA's covert training program, whose fighters can make tactical battlefield deals with Jabhat al-Nusra, it means al-Qaeda, without publicly allying with it. <laughs> so you have plausible deniability, but you're dealing with the ones that you claim did 9-11. Isn't that amazing? What do the 3,000 families think? Are they asleep? Are they awake? Are they in dreamland? Are they in the dream time? So that's uh, pretty shocking. Um, countering Putin, um, this is another, the talk of the town with uh, Condoleezza Rice and Robert Gates. One can hear the disbelief in capitals from Washington to London to Berlin to Ankara and beyond. How can Vladimir Putin, with a sinking economy and a second-rate military, continually dictate the course of geopolitical events? Whether it's in Ukraine or Syria, the Russian president always seems to have the upper hand. And uh, they, they go through this usual idiotic jargon. He's playing a weak hand very well. The U.S. is playing a good hand very poorly, all idiotic, all superficial, all so choked with cliches that the mind is never engaged. And then they go through a scenario of the responses. Uh, Putin's primacy, well, it's a sign of weakness by Putin, or he'll regret it. He'll be in a quagmire, or this will make a bad situation worse, or... Uh, maybe the Russians can help us. <laughs> well, um, we know uh, what to do. The policy here, just to state it in the middle of this uh, parade, is a condominium with Russia. In other words, certainly a condominium in the Middle East. The U.S. and Russia agree that certain outcomes are going to be necessary, and these will be imposed. And this will include Syria, where the Turkish-Syrian border will be closed and the uh, existing jihadis, this concentration of uh, lunatics and butchers in the ISIS genocide cult, they will be uh, shut down. They will be dispersed. They will be uh, dealt with. Uh, and at the same time, we can also uh, look forward to uh, other policy changes. Stop the insanity of trying to overthrow Assad work with existing governments, issue a very stern warning to Erdogan that his days as the secret chief of ISIS uh, are over, intolerable. So um, those and some other things would tend to expose the, the, the heart of the matter is that ISIS is a paper tiger. 
in spite of all of that hysterical propaganda. ISIS is 10 feet tall. They have supernatural